must confess I'm going to have to probably go back and do a little bit more research because I remember several years ago we had this thing called the swine flu that came through and they considered it to be an epidemic. And now we have this thing coming through called the coronavirus. It's in a pandemic. I'm going to have to go look those words up and find out what the difference is between them. But you know, even though we are going through something like this in this nation at this time, I think it's a good thing to know that God is still on the throne. Now, there are going to be some people that are going to be going out and trying to say, well, you know, this is all part of God's wrath. Maybe it's all part of God's love. You know? Maybe it has more to do with His love than His wrath. Because it's one of those areas, it's kind of like 9-11 was. It's one of those things where people actually begin to search again. And recognize, hmm, there is something missing right here. This morning we're going to take a look at the family business. It's found in John chapter 5. Jesus has been approached once again by the Jewish leaders and, well, they're starting to persecute him a little bit now. It's, it's moving beyond just being curious about what he's teaching. Now it's like, wow, he, he's not saying the things we want him to say. And if he's not careful, he's actually going to start to get the Roman Empire involved in this. And, well, you know, as Jewish leaders, we don't want the Roman Empire involved. We, we've been doing good about keeping them at bay. And yet he's starting to make this movement. I mean, you know, he's feeding 5,000 people. He's feeding 4,000 people. He's having large gatherings gathered together. There wasn't any coronavirus going on. They were able to meet. And yet, Jesus, feeling the attack, begins to speak from his heart in John chapter 5, beginning in verse 19. And out of reverence and respect for God's Word, would you please stand with me as we read these very important words that Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly I tell you, the Son can do nothing by Himself. He can do only what He sees His Father doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. For the Father loves the Son and shows Him all He does. Yes, and He will show Him even greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom He is pleased to give it. Moreover, the Father judges no one, but He entrusts all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not, either, uh, sorry, does not honor the Father who sent Him. Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Very truly I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in Himself, so He has granted the Son also to have life in Himself. And He has given Him authority to judge because He is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this. For a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear His voice and come out. Those who have done what is good and will raise to live. And those who have done what is evil will raise to be condemned. By myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear. And my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but Him who sent me. 
We thank you, Heavenly Father, once again for your word. And we thank you for this opportunity to spend some time in your word. Please open our hearts and minds to hear what it is that you want us to hear from your word today. For we are reminded, Heavenly Father, we can do all things through the one who strengthens us. So help us to be strong enough to hear and obey. For we ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Well, you know, we live in a culture today that, um, well, we're kind of uncomfortable with this whole idea of death. Uh, we don't really like to talk much about about death and, and the thing. In fact, we do everything we can to avoid it. We, we do everything that's possible to, to avoid, well, getting older. I mean, we have our skin care regimens, our, our plastic surgeries. We even go out and dye our hair to do the best that we can be, to keep from showing the signs of our aging. And thus, we want to show people that our mortality is further off than what it possibly is. Because we're always trying to keep it at bay. In fact, if our employers give us a bereavement leave at all, it is usually only for a couple of days and for immediately, immediate families only. In fact, within our culture, we kind of have this get-over-it attitude when it comes to bereavement. Now, in other countries and other areas of the world, they actually spend quite some time, weeks and maybe even months, in bereavement. But here in the United States, we start to quickly get over it and move on because we don't want to deal with the idea of death. But though we avoid physical, earthly death as much as possible, we know that there are other deaths that are going on all around us as well. There are spiritual deaths, and it is not quite so rigorously avoided. At times, we even see people run towards spiritual death, thinking that their way is better than God's way. Other times, we see people who appear to be trapped in that system of death. Some of them are trying to make it on their own, and others are in social systems of death that are, cre that are created because of poverty, pollution, or racism. Whether by our own making or the making of others, we live in a world that is permeated by spiritual death. Lent is a season to acknowledge death. Ash Wednesday urges us to confront our own mortality and reaffirm our dependency on God. But the entire season of Lent also does this. It is weighty as we fast and we pray prayers of repentance. We are constantly reminded of death, even by the deep, dark colors that symbolize Lent and Holy Week. Death feels so persuasive, it can be almost stifling. We may know that the feeling in our own lives, and we see it in the people that are around us, it can be easy to, sh to sink into hopelessness and despair in the midst of it all. To let the darkness begin to overcome us as well. But there is a voice. A voice that is calling to us in the midst of that darkness. And it may seem like it is far away at times, but it is there. And it is the voice of life and of hope. It pulls us from darkness and despair and reminds us that while death holds a tight grip on our world, death does not have the final word. Life does. And we can be part of the family business to bring life and resurrection into people's lives. You see, the Jews were familiar with family apprenticeship. I'm reminded of being one who grew up in a house that had a father who was a certified public accountant. And I remember going to school and struggling through classes like English, history, social studies, 
Those type of classes just, uh, I mean, I struggled. They were not my thing. But yet, when I got into math, oh, I excelled in math. I loved math. And then when I got into science, science was interesting. It was fascinating. It used a lot of math. I kind of liked science as well. Those were the things that I liked to be a part of. And I kept thinking, okay, where is this going to lead me? My dad liked numbers. I even in high school was able to take a business law course. I loved business law. A lot of my friends didn't like it at all. But I got into it. I understood it. Hey, and I'm thinking, okay, this is the direction. I'm going to go into the family business. I'm going to become a CPA just like that. Well, as you all can tell, God had a different idea. But that's okay. And sometimes when I look back and I think, well, maybe I didn't go into the family business that my dad was in as far as a CPA. But I'm still in the family business of raising my children, my grandchildren, in the fear of the adoration of the Lord, just like my dad did for me. I'm still a part of the family business. And his father before him was the same way. And his father before him was the same way. And when we go back generations, we have found that within our generation, we've actually had Baptist ministers within our family. Why? Because we truly believe in following Jesus. And we're a part of the family business. You see, back in those days, they did the work that the Father did. We see in the story of James and John, what are they out doing? Oh yeah, they are the son of Zebedee. Who is Zebedee? Zebedee was a well-known fisherman in the area. So guess what James and John were doing? fishing. It is even believed that that after the death and resurrection of Jesus that uh, what ends up happening it's believed because you see it in John chapter 21, what ends up happening? They don't know where Jesus is anymore. Jesus has made his appearance. They haven't seen him in a little bit. They have, aren't sure what to do. So what did James and John and Peter go out and do? Fishing. Okay, they actually did it with nets, but anyway... They go out and do the family business of fishing until Jesus shows up on the shore and says, Hey, have you all caught anything today? Well, no, we've been out all night. Didn't catch a thing. You all don't need to know, hear the rest of the story. You know that story, right? They went into the family business. That was what was normal. That was what was typical. In fact, it's even believed that Jesus was probably a part of the family business. We don't know this historically for sure, but, but there's a lot of speculations from theologians and biblical history, historians. And, and I have a tendency to believe this way as well, that part of the reason why Jesus waited until he was 30 before he started his ministry was the fact that the, his dad probably had passed away when he was younger, and so he went into the family business. Of doing what? Being a carpenter. Being a carpenter just like that. Probably worked long, hard days in the stone quarry around that area. Being the carpenter just like his dad. To try to keep food on the table. To take care of his mom. To take care of his siblings. And I truly believe that was the type of man that Jesus was. And then he begins the work of his father in heaven. Jesus is illustrating that he is an apprentice to God the Father. That in verses 19 and 21, he specifically touches on this theme. The Son is not working outside of the will of the Father, but is working as the Father works. He's trying to make sure he does exactly what it is that his Father is telling him to do. He has come to recognize and realize that the Father that I had on earth, I've taken care of everything that I was supposed to. Now I have a responsibility to my Heavenly Father who made sure sure that I came into existence, and now I'm going to fulfill that, and for three years he stayed upon this earth to fulfill exactly what it was his father had asked him to do. You see, the work of the resurrection is not regulated to a future coming, but it is already at work in the present. Jesus is doing the work of God in the world. 
In verse 21, he explicitly points to Jesus doing the work of the resurrection because he is doing the work of the Father, and that is the work of resurrection. There's a wife who went with her friend in, to the police station in order to report one of them miss, was missing her husband. The policeman asked for a description and she said, Well, my husband is six foot two inches, has deep blue eyes, dark wavy hair, athletic built, well groomed, and sharply dressed, and weighs about 185 pounds. He's very soft spoken, well mannered, and he loves my children. The friend spoke up and said, But your husband is fat, five foot three, rude, smokes cigars, bald, has a big mouth, never a base, dresses sloppy, his teeth are rotten, and he's terribly mean to your children. And the wife replied, Yes, but who wants that one back? Well, many times, what is going on in the present can become overlooked because we're so concerned with what the future is supposed to hold. Because many Jews believed in resurrection. It was a common belief that God would come to restore all things. The day of the Lord is a celebration that takes place within Jewish custom even today. And it would be one that of resurrection, of judgment. Whether judgment of a punishment or judgment of reward. The day of the Lord tended to revolve around judgment. While the imagery within the Old Testament text tends to allude to destruction, it is always towards those who are far away from God. The Jews didn't fear the day of the Lord. Instead, they viewed it as a day that all things would be made right. The righteous would be raised and there would no longer be oppression. The idea that a time was coming when the dead would hear the voice of God would already have been a very familiar trait for them. He did. He understood that what he was saying to them when he talks about that, that they will hear God's voice, they understood what he was talking about because it was part of their custom already. Did you hear the story about the old golfer who was standing in front of the first tee? It just so happened at the very first tee there was a water hazard all the way around the green. And the gentleman was trying to decide if the hole was too dangerous to use a brand new ball or should he use an old one. Well, he finally decided that he was going to use an old ball. And so he puts the old ball on the tee and he stands up there and just as he does, he hears a voice from heaven says, use the new ball. Well, unsure what he was supposed to do, but yet at the same time he still wanted to, well, heed the voice he was hearing. He decided to go and get the new ball. So he went over to his golf bag and he took out the new ball and he put it on the tee and he stood there and he got ready to swing and just as he's about ready to swing, he heard the voice from heaven again. You better take a practice swing. And so he does. He steps back and he takes his practice swing. And as he does so, he's feeling confident. And so he steps up next to the new ball and he gets ready to start the back swing. And he hears a voice say, Get the old ball! You all did not laugh and neither did Roxy, so I'm going on. His practice swing was terrible. Oh, yeah. I told that joke to, to Roxy yesterday. I was just laughing hysterically. She says, what's so funny? I read it. And she says, I don't get it. Okay, so, honey, if you're listening back there in the nursery, you are correct. I should not have used that joke. 
But as we move forward, there is an eschatological, an eschatological bent in this text as well. Because you'll see in the language of coming, we see that Jesus is affirming their belief that there will be a day that God restores all things. It is what God is, is there to do, is to bring things back into the righteous way, the right way. And they see these things are taking place and they understand that these are the things that are going on. These are the things that are supposed to happen. And so they understand that. They recognize that. This is not really anything new. When you and I read this, we have a tendency to look at it and say, whoa, what is Jesus trying to say here? But he's using language that they would have been familiar with. It was a part of this celebration. They had a celebration already in place that they would be celebrating the return of the Lord. But Jesus begins to talk about a present resurrection as well. And while Jesus talks about the future to come, he also speaks of a present resurrection that he is bringing about. Jesus is the embodiment of God on earth and is doing the work of God in the present. Jesus is already doing the work of resurrection. This power of present resurrection is illustrated in various miracles that he does throughout the Gospel of John. In fact, the most obvious one takes place in John chapter 11. Who can tell me what happens in John chapter 11? In John chapter 11 is the story in which Jesus goes and raises Lazarus from the tomb. There is a resurrection that takes place. It is not an uncommon thing for Jesus to be able to raise somebody from the dead. But it was not a common everyday occurrence, even in their society, any more than what it is in our society today. But Jesus proved that he had power over death. He understood the power of the resurrection, and it had been given to him by his heavenly Father. Even the ways in which Jesus heals others reserves the, them from disease and social death. It reminds them and it reminds us that these miracles taking place of being able to help the lame to walk, to being able to help the blind to see, these are resurrections of people's lives that are taking place. Even some of the smaller miracles will ultimately point to a larger miracle of Jesus' resurrection. <laughs> Those who listen to Jesus and follow Him experience resurrection in their current lives as well. There was a lady who said, I am a mother of three, ages 14, 12, and 3, and have recently completed my college degree. The last class I had to take was sociology. The teacher was absolutely inspiring with the qualities of which I and every human being would have been graced with. Her last project of the term was called SMILE. And what she was asking the class to do was to go out and to smile at three people and document their reactions. Now, the lady goes on to say that I am a very friendly person and always smile at everyone and say hello anywhere. So I thought this would be a piece of cake, literally would be a piece of cake for me. But soon after we were assigned a project, my husband and our youngest son and I went out to McDonald's on one crisp March morning. It was just our way of sharing a special playtime with our son. We were standing in line waiting to be served when all of a sudden everyone around us began to back away. And then even my husband backed away. I did not move an inch. But an overwhelming feeling of panic welled up inside of me as I turned to see why everybody had moved. As I turned around, I smelled a horrible dirty body smell 
and there standing behind me were two poor homeless men. As I looked around at the short gentleman close to me, he was smiling. His beautiful sky blue eyes were full of God's light as he searched for acceptance. He said, good day. And as he counted the few coins he had been clutching, the second man fumbled with his hands as he stood behind his friend. I realized that the second man was mentally deficient, and the blue-eyed gentleman was with him as his salvation. I held my tears as I stood there with them. And the young lady at the counter asked him what they wanted, and he said, Coffee is all, miss because that was all they could afford. And if they wanted to sit in the restaurant and warm up, well, they were going to have to buy something. And he just wanted to be warm. Then I really felt it. The compulsion was so great. I almost reached out and embraced the little man with the blue eyes. That is when I noticed that all eyes in the restaurant were set on me judging my every action. I smiled and asked the young lady behind the counter to give me two more breakfast meals on a separate tray. I then walked around the corner to the table that the men had chosen to rest at. And I put the tray on the table and laid my hands on the blue-eyed gentleman's cold hand. And he looked up at me with tears in his eyes and he said, Thank you. I leaned over began to pat his hand and said, I did not do this to you. God is here working through me to give you hope. I started to cry as I walked away to join my husband and son. And when I sat down, my husband smiled at me and said, This is why God gave me to you. Because you give me hope. We held hands for a moment, and at the time, we knew that only because of the grace that we had been given that we were able to give. That day showed me the pure light of God's sweet love. I returned to college, and on the last evening of the class, with this story in hand, I turned in my project, and the instructor read it. Then she looked up at me, and she said... Can I share this? I slowly nodded, and she got the attention of the class. She began to read, and that this is when I knew that we, as human beings and being part of God, share this need to heal people and to be healed. In my own way, I had touched the people at McDonald's. My husband, son, instructor, and every soul that shared the classroom on the last night that I spent as a college student. I graduated with one of the biggest lessons that I could have ever learned. The lesson of unconditional acceptance. You see, this unconditional acceptance is also a way in which we can experience resurrection and being a part of the family business. We live in an already but not yet kingdom of God. See, resurrection is not always something that has happened in the future, but it is also something that is happening right now, today. Bodily resurrection after death is just a continuation of the life abundantly already being lived out by those who follow Jesus. Often, our views of salvation and resurrection revolve around something to come in the far-off future. We focus heavily on what happens to us when we die. Where do we go? What's going to happen? We also focus on the idea of Jesus coming again to restore things and of God coming to bring judgment. While well, God is, in fact, going to come someday to judge, and there will be a bodily resurrection of the dead, the work is already happening. This is important for those of us that are living in the season of Lent. Well, we are in a season of grief and of confronting our mortality and sin, we still live in the ultimate hope of resurrection. 
Lent is a time of fasting. And we recognize that we live in the ultimate hope and the power of Jesus' resurrection, even in the dark times. This is a reminder to us to do the work of the resurrection in our world, even in the face of insurmountable obstacles, because we are in the family business. Just as Jesus was following the way of God and beginning the work of God in the world, we are to follow in the same way. There are often dark and dead places in, the world, in our world that need the refreshing word of resurrection. We can join God in this work. While this work may not be yet completed, it is a good resurrection work to be done in the present. We do not need to fear or avoid death like the culture around us because we have confidence that the work of resurrection is already at work in the world and will one day be fulfilled. Are you living like people of the resurrection now? Or are you only longing for the coming of God in the future? The work of resurrection should transform our lives in the present. Ways we use to gravitate towards death are overcome by the power of resurrection. The work Jesus began is a continuing work in the world through the Holy Spirit and through the people of God. The work of resurrection has already begun in us. The moment we hear the voice of Christ call us out with the words of life and the moment that we respond, we have lived in the power of the resurrection. Some of us have very compelling stories of the way that God has saved us from the brink of spiritual and sometimes even physical death. Others of us share a story of how God continues to work resurrection in our everyday lives in no less beautiful ways. We are all part of the resurrection. We've been called out of darkness and death into abundant life. While our culture avoids death and places that, in places that reek of it, we can look death right straight in the face. We can face it with deep confidence that the resurrection is already at work in our lives. We can grieve in hope and we can work in the dark and broken places, not with despair, but with hope. You see, the work of the resurrection often feels hard and unrelenting. But when we look for it, we can see that even in the darkest places, in the midst of Lent, when the days can be long, somber, and weighty, we can still celebrate. Because the power of resurrection is already here. In our prayers of confession, in the midst of our fasting, in our sincere repentance, the work Jesus began is still at work in the world. So thanks be to God that we can be part of the family business.